Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. So I think Eugenia gave a very nice introduction about me. Um, so I trained as a uh, uh, biologist, cell biology specifically. I did graduate school research, and then I moved to Dana Farber um, in Boston, where I did a postdoc. Uh, in 2012, I uh, became an editor at BBA. And uh, then I moved to Cell Reports. And in the past three years, I've been working on Star Protocols, which is an open access protocol journal um, that uh, publishes robust and working protocols. Uh, as part of Cell Press, one of the things we like to do is go around and talk to people about publishing and how to navigate the process. And I, I know that a lot of your graduate students, so you might not have published. Uh, but this is something that you will be doing uh, and hopefully doing it well with all this great background that you're getting uh, at the, the, the summer school. And I hope that I can demystify some of the, the process for you. And um, so if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the, the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer. Um, and uh, I definitely left a lot of time at the end for, for questions as well. Um, so I wanted to come take you on a journey uh, navigating the process of publication. And this is specific in some ways for self press, but most of the things are common among all publishing houses. Uh, so I've taken these images from a clever little pamphlet called the Cell Press Navigator. This was made um, kind of in the vein of um, an airline brochure, if we can even remember what those look like. Uh, so the first step is submitting your paper. And I think you've heard some great tips on like how to put your paper together as a story, I think. And I'll go through a little bit more about what an editor looks like, what, what an editor looks for, what a reviewer looks for along the way. So when you think about choosing your journal, what you want to do is look at your references, talk to your colleagues, your PI, uh, talk to editors at conferences if you get to go to meetings. Um, you can always write a pre-submission inquiry to a journal to say, I think I'm really interested in publishing here. Is this story good enough for your journal? Is it up to your standards? And Cell Press has recently launched a new um, pilot called the Cell Press Community. And it basically allows you to submit your paper to a community of journals and you select where they will be um, considered. And then you can um, choose your own adventure, basically, uh, based on what the reviewers and editors say. And it's a really nice way to give you options so you can figure out where the right place is for your work. So at Cell Press Journals, we have internal editors that will help you publish your story. Um, so each paper, when it comes in, is read carefully by an editor on the team. And the team will then discuss amongst themselves. All of our editors have scientific training that is appropriate for the journals that they work for. Um, and editors often discuss the papers. We have week daily editorial meetings uh, where we talk about papers. And then we decide, do we want to send it out for review or not? And some people actually consult with other experts in the field to find out, well, I'm interested in this, but what does the field think? So we'll actually, you know, send an email to someone just with the abstract, gauge their, their feeling and their temperature about the, the work. If we decide not to send it out to review, uh, we write an author email with a decision letter and say why we're not sending it out to review. So what do we look for in this initial assessment? Well, it kind of depends a little bit on each journal's editorial scope and the editorial bar of each of the journals. But we want to know, does it fall within the journal scope? For example, if I'm reading a paper for the journal Neuron, it's a paper about neuroscience. Uh, if uh, I'm reading a paper for cell reports, I'd be looking for anything that fits in the broad sphere of biology. So a very broad scope. Uh, so these are questions that an editor has to look at. Um, we also want to know if it addresses an interesting and important question um, and if it's advancing the findings of the field. Now, this bit about advancing the findings of the field can vary quite a bit 
um, what the strength of that advance is that's necessary for the journal. So for a journal like Cell, the strength of that advance has to be pretty high. The level of interest to the field and to the broader community has to be pretty high. Um, but at other journals, the strength of the advance can be a little bit lower. Uh, the need for mechanism can be a little bit different. And the way to learn what the differences are, I think it comes over time with reading papers. And once you start delving into the papers in your respective fields, you'll start to get a sense of what types of papers are published in this journal or that journal. So um, we generally just want good stories that are going to be interesting to the scientific field, interesting to the scientists that read our journal. And we also want to make sure that the study is robustly performed. So congratulations, you submitted your paper, the editors have assessed it and decided to send it out to review. What happens next? So the editors are working to secure the right reviewers. Um, that means we are looking for expertise. We are looking to avoid conflict of interest. Um, and the editorial uh, operations team will be sending reminders, chasing late reviewers, because everybody's busy. Sometimes things go late. Um, now, if things go really late, of course, I would say uh, you can contact the journal. And uh, if you decide to do so, uh, it's completely within your rights. <laughs> it is your paper. And you, you can check in on it. Uh, just be polite. I think that's the general take home message there. Um, so we get the reviews back from the uh, reviewers. We're going to read the reviews carefully. Sometimes we'll even discuss it amongst the editorial team. Um, and we'll talk about what needs to be done. We'll talk about the next steps and the decision that will be made. We might even ask the reviewers to comment on the other comments of the reviewers. So kind of getting a, a cross commenting discussion in play to find out, well, we they disagree about these points. So where, how can we come to a consensus? Um, so we also might um, discuss with the team, as I said, and come to a decision about what we're going to do with the paper. And the main decisions here are invite a revision or reject the paper. If we uh, send you a revision letter, that's great news. Now you have some experiments to do, probably. Um, so you want to read the decision letter and read through the reviews really carefully. Think about the points that the reviewers and the editors have made. And um, did the editor invite you to resubmit the paper? Um, or did they suggest you to transfer to a different journal? Um, so transferring to a journal um, other than the one you submitted to can actually be a really great way for you to get your work published quickly and uh, without going through another round of review. Lots of publishing houses, Cell Press, Nature, use this sort of approach. So you can submit to Cell or you can submit to Neuron. Your paper goes out to review there. If it doesn't quite meet the editorial standards of that journal based on the reviewer comments, then you can be offered uh, publication after revision in a journal like Cell Report. Um, or iScience, where they have a different editorial standard. Um, so reading the, the decision letter is super, super important. Take some time to digest it and think about what you want to do. So if you have a revision where the editor says, yes, we want to see this paper back, that's the message you're looking for. That's the message you're hoping to see. And then you start thinking about all the comments that the reviewers made and how you can address those comments. So you can even start beginning to draft your response. So a response to the reviewers is basically reviewer one says point one, and this is what I've got to do to address it. And oftentimes this starts as a revision plan, right? You'll get the letter and you'll sit down with or without your PI and think about what you want to do and how you're going to approach this. And honestly, I'm sure some of these experiments you've already had in your back pocket, right? You were saving for revision. <laughs> So make sure when you draft the response letter that you address all the comments one by one, even if you're not adding data, even if you're saying, well, this was shown in this paper, or I'm adding a supplemental figure for this, or, um, or if you're arguing a point, totally fine to do that, but make sure you address 
every comment that the reviewers give you, make sure you use science and evidence to argue with the reviewer. <laughs> because that's the best way to move forward in the process without having a reviewer that becomes incalcitrant, recalcitrant, <laughs> um, or argumentative. So uh, you, your revision is done, congratulations. Um, uh, now you need to submit the revised manuscript to the journal. Uh, so make sure you include all the reviewer's comments in your response, as I said. Um, Consider including a marked copy if the journal will allow it. <laughs> I find that it makes the, the, the job of the editor and the reviewer easier. Um, you can also consider discussing your revision plan with your handling editor before you start the experiment. And often journals will invite you to do this. And I highly suggest you take advantage when an editor says, there's a lot to do in this, this comments from these reviewers, uh, I think you should reach out to me in the next few weeks and discuss it. Take that opportunity, it'll probably save you a lot of time and headache. <laughs> and often what we'll do there is we'll get a revision plan from the authors and we'll check in with the reviewers and say, well, do you think this is going to be successful if they do these experiments? Um, and uh, it can also give you a sense of what's really required for a successful revision versus what's just kind of nice. I think overall, the tenor of your response to reviewers should be polite and professional. When you're going to be having help from a well-seasoned uh, veteran of publishing while you write your paper, so you'll definitely have a great lead there. Um, but always remember in your career to be polite and professional in your response and your correspondence with editors. Um, Surprising how easy it is to get frustrated with the situation and then get frustrated with the people behind the, the journal. So unfortunately, papers do get rejected and it's going to happen, happens to all scientists. So what do you do? <laughs> so read the letter and the comments from the reviewers carefully. And then I say step away a little bit, go for a run, go for a beer, whatever you prefer to do. And Consider each comment critically and carefully. Think about, well, are they right? Do they have a good point? Is this lacking the conceptual advance? Is this lacking on the mechanism? Um, and rewrite and resubmit. Think about how you can fix the paper based on what the reviewers have suggested. Now, if you're going to submit to a different journal, you might not have to address all of the comments raised, but I would say that some of the comments are probably really critical to address and you shouldn't resubmit the paper without addressing at least a few of the comments. <laughs> uh, you don't want to have the reviewers, um, possibly the same reviewers looking at your revision at another journal and thinking, why did they not address anything? I gave them such good feedback and they've really lost that opportunity. So never submit the same version of your article to a different journal after it's been reviewed. Um, there's always something that the reviewer says. And even if a lot of the book points you don't agree with, uh, if they're saying this part is unclear or saying some simple things that you might not have realized weren't, weren't put together properly or were presented in an unclear way, it's really critical for you to use that opportunity and that feedback to improve your paper. So yeah, the, the, the take home message is always use your reviewer comments. So there are chances when a paper gets rejected and either the editor has said, we are willing to consider a revision of this paper if you present a rebuttal. So a rebuttal is when the authors are putting up uh, evidence to suggest that their paper is strong and can overcome the hurdles that the reviewers and the editors see. That can either be something that is invited by the editor when we say, this is a reject right now. <laughs> There's a lot of work to do here. I'm not sure if you want to do all this work that's <laughs> listed by the reviewers. Um, but if you want to, you can come back after it's all done. Um, the other option for a rebuttal is when it's been rejected outright and we suggest you transfer to another journal, um, it's not appropriate. If you find that the reviewers are making comments that aren't really 
consistent or aren't really fair with what the paper shows, then it is reasonable for you to reach out to the journal and say, well, here's my point by point response to these reviewers, and here's why you should reconsider my paper. And in those cases, we'll look through the point by point response to reviewers. We will often consult with the reviewers again. If you find that the, if you're suggesting that the reviewers perhaps had a conflict of interest or weren't being fair in their comments, we might not go back to that reviewer. We'll get someone else with similar expertise to make sure that you get a fair stake. Um, overall, I think that reviewers and scientists that are you know, involved in the process are really looking out to make the best paper possible. And I think that is the overall goal of peer review. And I think it works 99.9% .9 of the time, but there are instant anything, there can be bad actors. And um, as I said, it doesn't happen that often. <laughs> But if you can make the argument and add data and show that you have a strong story, then it might be worth your time. But you really should be realistic. If the reviewers all say that the strength of the conceptual advance is not strong enough for this journal, for Cell, for example, then you're probably not going to have a good shot unless you change the foundational elements of your story. Um, so I think you have to be realistic about what your chances are. And that's something that, again, comes with time, talking to your PI, talking to your colleagues about how you can improve your work. So <laughs> let's go back to the revision. <laughs> so let's say that you've gone through revision, your paper has now been editorially accepted, um, the handling editor is going to help you craft your abstract, they might help you with your highlights, your graphical abstract, because these are all the things that people see first about your paper. And this is really how you make interest in your paper from readers. Um, so after that, the paper gets handed off to the production team, and the production team helps with um, getting the paper um, into the journal. So I wanted to mention one important thing about our production process. We have wonderful production editors across Cell Press. And the thing they help you do is really format the paper, um, make sure it looks as, as good as you want it to look, and look to the journal standards. The other thing that our production team will do is go through the images um, with a special software that looks for duplication of images, looks for possible fabrication of data, anything that might not be um, consistent with scientific rigor. So the guidelines in general about putting your figures together and putting your story together, and I'm sure your PIs will tell you this and that you'll have training around this, but as an editor, it is my job to also tell you that you should be only reporting real, unfabricated data. You should be sure to reference the work that you have cited. You should not <laughs> use too much of the, the language in other papers. Um, do not uh, you know, copy paste repeatedly, make sure you're using your own words. Um, make sure you declare any conflicts of interest and save all of the relevant data from your published article. When you publish that paper, something like this can come up right after production happens, or it can come up when someone reads your paper online and notices something strange. And they'll reach out to the editors and the production team of a journal to find out what happened. Uh, so for example, we might have uh, a query about an image duplication. You've probably seen things like this on ret retraction watch, where people read the papers and they're highly interested and then find duplications, things that really shouldn't be done. But most of the time, it turns out that these are just mistakes that people made. Uh, sometimes, of course, it's not. but if you save the published data, if you save all of the data that went into that paper, you will be much better off. And the headache that you could have from that experience will be much, much easier. So save all your published data, make sure it's all organized, and it's just a, a good habit to get into, and I'm sure your PI will be appreciative. So after your paper has been accepted and published, 
Um, take a moment to celebrate, open a bottle of champagne with your lab mates uh, and celebrate the process. Uh, we also work with your institution to make sure that we've met all of the funding mandates. Um, we use different ways to promote your article on social media, on our blogs. And um, if you see us at conferences, especially after you've worked with us, make sure you come and say hi. You can always pose with the journal at the conference booth. Um, we, we always like to see authors and uh, at, at the booth. And uh, so my final tip um, for this section are editors are there to help and we're happy to help, but we're busy and we handle a lot of papers. So be concise in your communications with us um, and with reviewers and focus on the science at all points. Um, Wait at least 24 hours before sending any responses, especially if you get a rejection. I know that it's really difficult. It's your project you've been working on for years, and it's only natural to be frustrated with this, uh, with a rejection. But as I said, it's happened to everybody in science, so um, it's just part of the process, and hopefully it can help make your paper better in the end. So. A lot of these things will actually fit very well with the talk from Holly, I think, because it's, it, it just did a great job of telling you how to tell your story. What I'm going to be focusing on here is just a little bit about how to write your story in a way that will be useful for editors and useful for the reviewers of your paper and ultimately of interest to readers once it's published. Because if you think about it, it's reading your paper will lead to citations of your paper. So you want people to be interested in your paper. So you want people to see the title and see the abstract and say, wow, that sounds really cool. So this is basically how you put together an article. And it's not the same as how you read an article, right? You typically read an article in a linear fashion, but you build the article starting with your figures and tables. And I think my advice for young researchers is as soon as you have your first experiment in the can that you're like, this is a cool result, I'm excited about this, make sure you have all your replicates and have everything in figure format so you have this thing done and closed up. And then you write up that figure legend so it says this is the, the end, this is the replication, and all of the details in that figure legend. And that's really the foundation of your paper. And once you start having enough of those little snippets of papers, of, of figures, you can really start to build a manuscript, hopefully, with a cohesive story using some of the tips that Holly gave. Um, the next thing is really working on that methods, results, and discussion. And honestly, I could take an hour just to talk about writing these parts. I just wanted to give you a quick overview for some of the tips on writing these sections. Um, and the conclusion and introduction are really going to help walk people through the paper take them on a journey, if you will, of the manuscript and what, um, and what the story shows. And finally, you'll write your title and abstract. And it's odd that that's the last thing you write, but really you'll see that as you're writing the paper, it doesn't come together until you write all of these other pieces first. Um, and so I think I wanted to start with just the, the really high level points about writing a paper and what I think is important. And I would say my other major piece of advice for young, um, young researchers uh, is to find a paper that is from a PI whose work you enjoy reading and really just dissect that paper, read it over and over again. Because what I've learned after reading papers for 10 years is, well, 10 years as an editor, um, is that there is a very, very logical pattern to how papers are, work. And once you can, you know, take away the, the oh, the results in this is oh, it's so complicated. Once you can kind of strip that away and see the really uh, clear format of how a paper works, it's really powerful. And so to be able to find one paper that you're like, this is really cool paper, I really like it, then just read it four or five times and think about the structure of it. Don't think about the results anymore. And what you'll see is it's a well-written paper, just like a really nice talk at a conference, 
it really leads you through the story. It says, okay, here's what I'm going to talk about. And in the abstract, it's okay, here's, here's the problem. Um, and then there's a sentence about, here's what I did. <laughs> and then there's a couple sentences about why that's important and what the next steps are. And in the introduction, you're setting the reader up. That you're saying, these are the things you need to know generally in order of importance or uh, in decreasing order of like specificity uh, that you'll need to know to parse these results. And then as you go through the results, what you're going to find you do is you start with you know, a, a title that's similar to what your figure legend would be. And you say, so we did this experiment to look at this hypothesis. And this is the experiment we did. You have a couple sentences for that. And then you say, OK, and this was the conclusion of that experiment. Based on that, we set up another hypothesis to test. And then you do the same thing in the next section of the results. And you really just go through each one in that kind of order of hypothesis, idea, tested, conclusion. And it goes through like that with the results. And it, once you can kind of dissect that, outline of a paper, you'll just find it so much easier to start writing one <laughs> because it's taking away that that difficulty of the language and um, just the fact that there's, you know, interesting, exciting science. If you just think about what the, the structure of the, the sentence is and what each sentence accomplishes, you can really learn how to write a paper, I think. Um, okay, well, sorry for that long rant about that, but I really do hope that it's helpful um, advice uh, and it's something I, I go on and on about every time. And I wish I could go back in time and tell my graduate school <laughs> these things. So, okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about are results and figures. As I said, um, oftentimes publishers are checking figures for manipulation. And just be sure <laughs> you're not doing anything that's not okay. Like it's changing the, the font, changing the contrast, changing the brightness. Um, so you want to make sure you don't do a lot of beautifying of images. You don't reuse your loading controls on Western blots. And if you do have to do anything like splice a gel or you know move things around or show an image where it's got a different contrast, then make sure that you mention that in the figure legends and say exactly what you're doing. Um, the other thing you want to do is make sure that your figure format is consistent with what's been published in the field. I think it just makes the jobs of the reviewer easier. Um, I'm not saying that it has to be pitch perfect in terms of the style and the font. It doesn't have to follow a particular format in that way. But I'm talking about the conceptual point of the figure, how the figure is organized in terms of um, the, the color contrast of the images, things like that. So again, reading papers in journals in your field is the best way to learn how to put figures together. Um, so the figures should only include the essential information for telling your story. Um, you don't need to be telling, uh, telling lots of supplemental items. Those can go in supplemental figures. Um, and you want to be clear with your figure legends. Make sure you include how many replicates were used um, and what you did. Um, and having that information in as soon as those experiments are done is critical because you know it can take years to write a paper, but your first result could happen in your first year of graduate school. So make sure you have all that noted and make sure you have all the data saved. So the abstract, I think I could talk about the abstract for quite a bit of time. And I think writing a good one is really, really critical for the success of your paper from the submission to its publication. Um, and the way it's read is, you know, super important, as I said. So you want a clear abstract that people are going to read um, and be interested about. So the abstract in the simplest term are, is basically a list of what's known what's unknown, what did you do, and why does it matter? So you want to make it interesting and understandable, but but you still need to be accurate and specific. Um, I recommend getting lots of feedback on your abstract. It's only 150 words or so, so it's pretty easy to get feedback from people. 
on it. Uh, so, and, you know, even get insight from people outside of your field to find out what they think. Um, and uh, the cover letter is something that I don't think I've talked about yet, but the cover letter is part of your submission package to a journal. What the cover letter allows you to do is kind of have a conversation, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the editorial team and tell them anything that you're concerned about. So first, you're gonna tell them about the contribution that this paper makes. You can tell them about why you are submitting to this particular journal. For example, if there's two or three related papers or um, you have um, talked to one of the editors of the journal, you can include that there. Um, you should also include copies of related work that's submitted or in press. Um, if you know of any competing labs or you have any particular deadlines, this is a good time to put it in. So you can include reviewer suggestions. Um, we may or may not use them depending on their suitability, and we do allow reviewer exclusion. Um, for cell press, it should be no more than three people, and editors do our level best not to use the reviewer exclusion. Um, so I did want to just take one moment to talk about star protocols because I'm excited about my journal and I think I wanted to share with you because you all have this awesome technical expertise that might be relevant for, um, for star protocols. So my picture about STIR Protocols is that it's a uh, open access journal that focuses on publishing robust working protocols. Most of our protocols are linked to published articles. It's not a strict requirement for publication, but we are finding that reviewers find it more, find it easier to go in, look at the results that this, um, this protocol yielded by looking at the full published paper. It's, as I said, it's not a strict requirement, but it's definitely something that does seem to help the review process go more smoothly. So what are star protocols? They are structured, transparent, accessible, reproducible. They're peer reviewed, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. They are open access and they're dynamic and adaptable and mostly usable. We really focus on you download the PDF, you print it out, or you get the Word document, you take it to the bench and you use it. And that's what we want you to do. Um, and we also try to make the process super easy for authors. So how can you help? I, so I wanted to give a pitch. If you're interested in getting experience as a peer reviewer, uh, we have an option to sign up as a volunteer peer reviewer. As part of that, you can go through a peer review certification process that Elsevier offers at the Researcher Academy. The Researcher Academy also has some really great tips for writing papers, um, for networking, so much great content, and it's all free. Um, so you can volunteer for peer review. You can submit a protocol, of course. Uh, join our feedback group uh, to help us improve the site. Um, and if you have any questions about this or you want more information about joining our reviewer pool, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I want to thank you all and take your questions. Thank you so much, Shona. And uh, we do have a question that goes really nicely with your last slide. Uh, the question was, how can somebody who is not a PI and not an established person become a reviewer? <laughs> Which uh, some of you have answered that maybe you could elaborate some more. I'm still muted. Yeah. You Hold muted? On. Yeah. Okay, you're good there. Yeah. Better? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I use Teams every day. So yes, uh, we would be happy to have you review for STAR protocols. The reason that we can reach out to a, a slightly younger audience that so we have on our advisory board, for example, is made up of assistant professors, people that work at core facilities that have really robust technical expertise. Um, and we have a lot of postdocs and graduate students that are on our volunteer reviewer pool. The reason is because we're asking people to look at the protocol to find out is it complete? Is it, um, does it cover the comprehensively the protocol steps? 
um, could you take it to the bench next week and go do this experiment? And so we give some training and some advice about how to approach that. Um, we probably could do better there. I want to do more there because I think it's a huge, huge help and so much interest from um, graduate students and postdocs about this point. So yeah, please feel free to visit our website and sign up. Uh, we'd be happy to have you. Awesome, thank you. That's a pretty special opportunity there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I also loved your abstract formula, the known the unknowns. <laughs> that just captured it so well. Um, yeah. Other questions uh, that come up, I think, uh, it's the journals in the recent time, several different journals, and I'm not sure about if you guys do this or not, uh, began to publish responses to reviewers as a part mm -hmm. of the uh, submitted paper. Uh, is this something you do and what are your opinions about this? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so at Star Protocols, we don't do that. Uh, we've thought about it, <laughs> but um, the there are journals at Cell Press that are doing this. Cell Systems, most notably, is publishing the peer review reports and really selling the benefit of peer review. And I do think it's it's useful. And it's also a great way to learn how to review papers. And I've heard a lot of people that are that have applied to be editors, scientific editors, that used that, that went to journals that had published reports and looked at what people said and thought about how would the review process work. And I think that's what's really great about it. And that said, <laughs> I think that um, I mean, if it's blinded, if you don't um, give away the name of the reviewers in publishing that, um, I think it's a really useful thing to have, especially if, if the authors want to share it. <laughs> so it can be super useful, but not all authors are comfortable sharing and not all reviewers want that information available. So um, overall, I think it's a good thing for transparency and for learning more about the process. Nice. Uh, we have another question. Um, uh, about the review process. So when you receive the comments from the reviewers, do you typically add it for appropriateness or review them before passing them on uh, to the authors? Yeah, that's a great question. So sometimes, yes, I have edited out things. <laughs> um, the other thing that I've done is, um, it doesn't happen very often, by the way. I should say, um, if it's really egregious, then I will reach out to the reviewer and talk to them and give them a little, you know, talking to about being respectful. Um, but it doesn't happen very often. I think the other approach that we've taken to this is just telling the authors um, in advance when we write the decision letter that, you know, reviewer two um, has some harsh comments here. Um, I hope you can get past that and look at the scientific elements. If there's no scientific basis for what they're, you know, screaming and using exclamation points about, then I will definitely write to the, the reviewer and, you know, ask them to edit the comments. Um, if it's something very minor, then I will just edit, you know, if there's 18 exclamation points and it's not just, this is an awesome paper, then I'll probably <laughs> get rid of most of the exclamation points. <laughs> Great, thank you. And uh, another question would be is, um, oh, so you mentioned that the you obviously it's screened for, uh, for plagiarized text or fabricated data. What actually happens if you were to find some? I'm not sure if you uh, have. Yeah, I guess so. Um, for plagiarism, usually it, um, we will send the paper back to the authors and tell them to address the concern. I send them a report. The report basically will show exactly where the problems are, and then the authors can revise the paper accordingly. I think it's useful to give people a chance. Um, I think a lot of times it's just not, they don't know that this is a problem. Um, so I think that's why we, I like to include that. So with the image manipulation um, screening, we do that before the paper gets published. So the worst, the best case scenario is that something gets flagged and usually it's not really a problem. The editors will look at it and say, oh, it's a spliced plot, but the, the, the authors have mentioned that in their figure legends. So this isn't a problem. 
The second op option is that there is a problem. We contact the authors. And if the authors can resolve it by providing the full, unedited, unmanipulated data, and we can see what the figure is, then we can resolve it without a new figure. Um, sometimes we have them rebuild the figure totally, and we'll scan it through again just to make sure it, you know, it's well done. Um, and then in the worst case, if we find that there is something wrong, the paper will be pulled from production. It will not get published. And if it's really egregious, we might contact the um, institution um, and let them know that this is a problem, just so they can have a discussion with the PI and the authors of the paper to make sure that this is a pattern and to make sure that people know what the expectations are. And that's why it's so important to save all your data, make sure all the experiments you're doing, first of all, align with what the standards are for your field. Talk to your PI, talk to the other folks that you work with in the lab, make sure you're doing things and pro processing your data in ways that are okay based on the standards of your field. Um, and make sure you take really good notes in your lab book so you can remember what you did. <laughs> for sure. Would you accept if uh, there was an issue with some blot, but the authors can no longer provide the original image? Would you accept redone blots or reproduction? Yes, we've actually had that happen, yeah. And sometimes it can take a couple extra weeks for that experiment to be redone. Um, so it is kind of a difficult thing for the, the, the researcher, I'm sure, to have to go go through that experience. But um, And then the other thing we've had is people saying, oh, we had to go to Iron Mountain and get the, uh, all the all lab done. Um, um, so I think, sorry. There's an echo. I'm OK, sorry. I was distracted by the echo. <laughs> sorry. It's probably from me. Yeah, okay. This is the only two of us talking. <laughs> um, what are your feelings on um, uh, putting the publications up on by archive or some other, uh, you know, public access journal before the great question. mission? Yeah, I think. I think BioArchive and other uh, preprint services like SSRN, they're super great. I think they're serving a huge need that the community has. Um, I think that the fact that these have grown so quickly, it says that scientists want this. And, you know, in that case, I think publishers are always like, okay, if that's what scientists want. But I think there is the caveat that these are not peer reviewed and that sometimes the general public doesn't understand what's peer reviewed and what's not. And that's the thing that I think is difficult about the preprint process. And that's something that publishers need to be better about saying, this is what peer review is, this is the benefit of it. And that's why going back to publishing the peer review reports, so useful, right? To show people that it's worth going through the process. I mean, sometimes, yes, it's, it's fine to just put something on a preprint um, server. If the person in your lab is left and you just want to get the data out there, um, sometimes that's all you need to do. Um, <laughs> other times, if you you know really need to show and have the publication credit, it's that's what's good for the peer review process. Is good for that. It gives you the publication credit. It helps you get the paper formatted and edited in a way that's um, professional and also helps disseminate your work more broadly. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one more question is about, so you, you mentioned that you often ask for recommended reviewers and sometimes journal ask for reviewers who you do not want to send publications. Mm -hmm. So what's the reason for asking the post review for the names of the uh, opposed reviewers? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. I think it's just that oftentimes people know that there's a competing paper or people have arguments in science, I think. <laughs> Um, and so that's why we, you know, if people have that, um, if they know someone has given them bad critiques in the back uh, or they've disagreed about, you know, some major tenant, um, it's fine to put those names in there. And you don't have to disclose why you're, you know, why you're saying you don't want this person to review. Like I said, we respect it. Um, just be reasonable and make it fewer than three people. Um, and then with your reviewer recommendations. Um, 
it's best to recommend people that are actually the right people to review your paper. So not your postdoc advisor or not someone you've worked with a lot, you know, someone who actually has the right expertise and can look at the paper and evaluate it. And the best way to find those people is when you're at your poster and someone comes by and talks to you about your poster, oh, whose lab are you in? Oh, okay, we're sending our paper to such and such journal. Do you think you and your PI could review this work? That's a great time because that person, if you haven't published with them, they are interested in your work. You've talked about it with them. They published something that's related, perhaps. Um, that's a great way to find and suggest reviewers. So you're not worried that those folks that are being suggested are somehow already on the author's side? They're a little biased in that regard? <laughs> I think that, um, so the data, so from Elsevier, they have data to show that the suggested reviewers are more likely to agree to review, but they're not more likely to say accept the paper. If you, if we look at the conflict of interest, right? You have to screen for that conflict of interest. So if they're recommending someone who it turns out have tons of paper with them, then yeah, we won't invite that person. <laughs> but it's totally reasonable to invite someone who you've met at a conference and talked about your work with, or someone who talked it to you after you gave a talk. Um, and it, that's what we would expect to see, right? Because they know the the talk already. They know the work already, and um, they're kind of primed for review. They're going to be great reviewers. So, um, yeah, I think it's a balance for us. We always use um, reviewers that know our journal. Um, we look for people that have the right expertise. So, in a paper that has mass spectrometry, for example, we'll make sure to get a mass spec expert, but we'll also get people who know more of the conceptual elements of the conclusions that the mass spec work has shown with the paper. Um, so we like to get a balance of reviewers in terms of expertise and technical acumen. Nice. Well, um, I guess I'll ask you one more question uh, about this. But uh, we had the uh, editor of Cell, your colleague, Lara, come to, uh, to give yeah. a talk. Uh, here at Madison a few years ago, and she had mentioned that you keep a secret database of all the reviewers <laughs> that you then <laughs> source people from. <laughs> Can you tell us more about this database? <laughs> Did she give away a trade secret? <laughs> yeah, no, she didn't. I mean, we definitely have um, a reviewer list uh, of people, especially for start protocols, where it's all volunteer reviewers. And they're not typically people we're going to find very easily because usually these tools to find reviewers, they, you know, they look at H index, which is, you know, a metric of how much you're publishing. Um, but yes, we do have databases of reviewers in Editorial Manager, which is the system we use to go through and manage our papers. Um, and we also have databases in Excel and things like that where, you know, we like to have people that know our journals, right? So if you have an, uh, um, something, if you have a relationship with a journal, um, it's a good thing to cultivate. You can always ask, especially if you've been reviewing a lot for a journal, you're always welcome to ask questions and answers because they're very grateful for your help. Well, this was wonderful. Thanks for sharing uh, all this information and uh, I hope our participants take advantage of the opportunity to peer review for Star Protocols and uh, once again thanks a lot.